Hello, everyone, and welcome to our last session of the day for, uh, for our group. Uh, in this session, we want to hear perspectives that come not so much from the organizations, which is what we talked about in our last hour, but more from the individuals who are working on the front lines, who are living with folks uh, impacted by substance use disorders, uh, who are uh, using opioids uh, for the right reasons, uh, maybe in the wrong way. Um, and so we, we're going to start uh, with a perspective from Dr. Ed Caparelli, who is uh, uh, a clinician, a member of the One Tennessee Board, but obviously very passionate and with years of experience, if that doesn't make him sound old, uh, <laughs> years of experience uh, working with patients uh, uh, and very uh, articulate about the, the need for uh, not a one-size-fits-all kind of approach. So, uh, Dr. Caparelli, uh, I think you're uh, on the screen. Is there anything you want to say? Uh, we're getting ready to start the video that he prepared. Uh, in the event that he couldn't be here, he felt like this was important enough that he, he wanted everyone to hear what he had to say. Caparelli, I'm a family physician working in Scott County, Tennessee, as medical director for Mountain People's Health Councils, which is a federally qualified health center group with six clinics, 14 medical providers, and integrated behavioral health with counselors and case managers. In a county of 22,000 people, we have 12,000 active patients, of which almost 1,000 are being treated for chronic pain, along with their other medical problems. We do all aspects of primary care, including wellness, chronic illness, chronic pain, and substance use disorder. In addition, I've been an active participant in the Knox Area Drug Task Force for several years, so I am very aware of the potential dangers of opioids. It is estimated that 20% of all American adults suffer with chronic pain. This surpasses the prevalence of diabetes, COPD, and peptic ulcer disease. Unfortunately, we have few tools to treat chronic pain. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, the problem of chronic pain was deemed very important and opioid prescriptions were encouraged. As overdose deaths began to emerge, the use of opioids in the management of chronic pain became a concern. The individuals most affected by this paradigm shift are those suffering from chronic pain. Beer's criteria caution against the use of NSAIDs in the elderly. Federal recommendations and new state laws have cut down on the acute use of opioids beyond three days. Very few new patients are receiving opioids despite suffering from chronic pain that significantly affects their daily lives. Fewer and fewer primary care providers are willing to write opioids for any reason, but especially for chronic pain. The number of pain clinics has decreased significantly and the remaining clinics have become very closely monitored and the wait times to get in can be several months. As a result, fewer patient prescription opioids are being prescribed, leading to less diversion of prescription opioids. The emergence of the more dangerous and illegal substance, substances such as heroin and fentanyl on the street has only shifted the pain with no relief in sight. One large group that has been largely ignored in all of these deliberations are the legacy patients that began taking opioids when it was encouraged and that have been following the rules for years. They do not abuse their medications. Urine drug screens are consistent. Controlled database reviews show that they are filling their prescriptions timely and they believe that the opioids are allowing them to function. Unfortunately, insurance companies have begun to come down hard on physicians that write opioids. I know of no physician that has ever been sanctioned for writing too many prescriptions for metformin. <clears throat> I know of no physician being told that they should not write for PPIs long-term, even though the FDA indication is for short-term use only, and long-term use has been linked to early onset Alzheimer's. However, I do know of several physicians that have been sanctioned for writing opioids. There are no new pharmaceutical alternatives for treatment of chronic pain in the elderly versus many new medications and formulations for diabetes and COPD. 
Alternative treatment modalities are either not covered or are difficult to get authorization to provide. For example, chiropractic treatments are specifically not covered by TenCare. Referring these patients to counseling has not been well received either. They say, we are not crazy, we just have pain. For me to go into long-term compliant patients and tell them that we are cutting back on their pain medications, I must have an alternative that is easily available and acceptable to the patient. To date, I do not have those alternatives. I'm hoping that our discussions over the next few days can help us to find some. Thank you. My apologies for the lack of video with that. Uh, Dr. Caporelli had uh, worked hard to produce a video, but for some reason we didn't have the video today. It's the first major glitch of the day, but we will uh, provide a link to that on the dashboard so that people can view it throughout the uh, conference. And we can also send you that link, those of you who are in the room today, since you didn't get to see Dr. Caparelli. Dr. Caparelli is on the line though, so I want to just acknowledge him and ask if there's anything he wants to add or any comments he wants to make in addition to what was on the video. Uh, thank you, Lisa. No, I think the, the uh, video was, was fairly clear. I, I'm just perplexed. I, I really feel badly for my patients that hurt. Uh, I, I have a real, I tell you, when I spent um, uh, the, the time tapering people down when they went from telling us if they have pain, give them more to saying, oh no, we need to limit how much opioids it was a fight. Uh, you know, when I go in, I can spend two minutes and everyone leaves happy with a smile on their face by just refilling their prescriptions, or I can have a 30 minute fight and they go out cussing me when I tell them I'm cutting back on their, on their pain medicine. Uh, they'd rather I cut off their arm than to cut back on their pain medicines, I think, just about. So I'm just concerned that we find if our goal is to limit these individuals. And I look back, I looked at my patient uh, population. I've been doing some drill down since I made that video. And uh, roughly of the 175 patients I had three years ago that were on chronic pain medication, about 36 have been taken off. Only two asked to be tapered down. Another 12 died from different reasons. Uh, and um, about 18 or 19 ended up being taken off them because their urine drug screens were showing stuff they shouldn't have shown or were not showing stuff they should have shown but there's very, very few people that want to be tapered down. They want to continue. And the 135 patients that I still have uh, that are taking chronic opioids, it's a real problem for me to say, I'm going to go in and tell you, even though you've taken these medicines for 25 years, we are going to start the tapering process and get you off in the next six months. It's just not feasible without having some alternatives. Thank you. Uh, as I said, very passionate advocate for the people, his patients, uh, who, who, for whom he tries to do his best. There's no doubt. Uh, next up on our uh, lineup today. Um, okay, is uh, Wayne Smith, and uh, Wayne, I'm gonna. Uh, Wayne is a pharma retired pharmacist. Um, and is currently one of our academic detailers, but he has done a lot of work in outreach in his community as well. So uh, Wayne, uh, Wayne, if you wouldn't mind to share with us just kind of the perspective, the thoughts you have, and in particular, what are some of the unmet needs, the issues that you see um, uh, formerly in your practice and today as somebody who's just uh, very active in the community? Uh, yeah, at least I'd be happy to make some comments. Uh, I have a 50-year career as a pharmacist, uh, 20 years in retail, 20 years in long-term care with nursing homes, and the last 10 years of my career was spent uh, servicing adolescent mental health facilities and drug treatment facilities. So I have a pretty good working knowledge of how things work in the facilities where you have medication assisted treatment. And uh, also the uh, issue concerned with uh, uh, patients taking uh, opioids or other pain medications uh, for chronic conditions. I, I agree with Dr. Uh, Caporetti. Uh, 
there's a lot of people you just can't take them off medication. Uh, pain is real. It does exist. I know personally, because I had some serious back issues that went on for years. And I had to take, uh, for several months, I had to take opioids. And uh, I, I really didn't enjoy taking opioids. They did have side effects to them. And I didn't get addicted because I'm smart enough to know better. But the problem was I needed that pain medication. I know what pain feels like. And uh, there are a lot of people that have chronic conditions that rely upon medication and uh, you just can't take it away from them. Uh, the insurance companies uh, and then to, the, to a large extent, some of the drug companies just really tick me off sometimes because of the way they do things and the rules that they just come up with in a boardroom someplace and it, it don't always apply to people. Um, but uh, the, the conference itself, I think, it, the problem that we have is getting the word to more people. And so I'm hoping through the efforts of One Tennessee, uh, who's sponsoring this event, uh, we're going to be able to get the word out to more people to make a bigger difference uh, in prevention uh, as well as treatment for the opioid disorder. Um, one of the things that uh, we had talked about previously is the fact that in the state of Tennessee, and in, in other places as well, the number of prescriptions written by doctors has gone down significantly. I mean, we're, we're talking about 50% of what it was five or six years ago. Um, and so the doctors are doing a pretty good job of trying to keep the opioid epidemic from spreading. But unfortunately, the availability of the heroin and fentanyl and other such things on the illegal drug market is continuing to cause a significant problem. Uh, and something I discussed earlier today is the fact that in the last 12 months, we've had more people to die of drug overdoses in this country than in any 12 month period in our history. 80, almost 84,000 people died from a drug overdose. It's suspected that some of those people actually committed suicide because of issues concerning COVID-19 or other depression issues. Uh, events like we're doing here today are important. The more people you get involved and the more people that are willing to participate and do their part to advance information and advance prevention techniques and get people the help they need, the better off we're all going to be. I've been doing this for a long time. It's a battle. It, it's not over with, it's just really getting started. There's a lot of folks that have talked today that have done a great job. There's lots of organizations out there that are doing their part, but it's still just not enough. We need more. We need more people involved. We need more people that care. It really, it touches you. Uh, it's like being somebody you know has had COVID-19. Well, there's probably somebody you know right now that's been addicted to drugs and you might not even know it. So it's important that you pay attention and that you listen and you try to do your part to move things forward in a good direction. And anybody who has questions for me in that matter, I'll be tickled to death to answer. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much, Wayne. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I hesitate to put people on the spot, but there are quite a few folks that are on this that I haven't had the opportunity to get to know personally to really kind of know what your background is or what your perspective is. So if, if you don't mind, I might just call on you randomly to share your perspective as an individual and as a professional working in this field. Um, uh, Bill Gibson, for some reason, my mind, my eye goes to you and your photo uh, because it looks like a beautiful grandchild that you're with there. Um, tell us your perspective. What, what, what is it that you see that you want to change? So we're seeing um, just major uh, upticks and probably COVID related somewhat overdose deaths. And we're just having a hard time uh, reaching out 
getting to these people at this point in time. When you say we, can you tell us who, who you work with? Well, at I mean, I'm going to turn. I'm sorry. <laughs> there. Oh, okay. Power of Putnam. <laughs> Power of Putnam. We're the Substance Abuse Prevention Coalition for Putnam County. Uh, we work regionally with several similar uh, county coalitions, but we're also networked with Tennessee Tech University and also the Upper Cumberland Human Resource Agency on some, some pretty um, cutting edge outreach projects. Um, just to go into that a little bit, we're, we're doing a project with the university to reduce the uh, diversion of medications prescribed for animals, uh, veterinarian medications. Um, we've, we've kind of found some research and we're gathering some additional research on that problem as, as the availability of prescriptions um, tightens up. People are turning to alternative sources and one is uh, vet shopping. And I'm not sure how many people are aware of that. It's, it's kind of a it's kind of a developing area. And then uh, the Upper Cumberland Human Resource Agency has developed um, a uh, substance abuse solutions department to try to work in the 14 county region. They're doing a, a two year uh, kind of a wraparound services for transportation, recovery to work uh, projects, housing, as well as uh, treatment. And as part of that, we were actually contracted with the police department when they get a call that has a social services aspect, maybe a, a disorderly person, maybe somebody that's homeless. Um, the police department actually refers that to one of our uh, caseworkers that go out 24 seven and sort of the police hand off the, the situation. And then we start working with the person to, to try to get them into emergency housing and then temporary housing and longer term housing treatment and all the, the things that they need. But the thing that makes it kind of unique is a two year commitment. Um, once somebody comes into uh, this, we will stay with them and keep working with them uh, with, a, with a peer support, a peer recovery support person for two years. And that's the first time I've seen something that you know, where you would stay that involved with the individual from, you know, from the police call for the next two years. Uh, we're also starting a Tin Rocks docket here off the pattern of, of Judge Sloan. Uh, we're working with them. Uh, we've got a, a judge committed and we're looking at a July start date, full fledged uh, for a Tin Rocks uh, court, court project. The most we've ever had was about 70,000. It's a nationwide. So this year's 